Hello everyone, this is FPV Angel and One Conscience. Also on the panel with us is Jimbo, P900 Coolpix Sandra and James. If you have been following our research, you will see how the Nazca lines, sacred geometry and scriptures record into a technological and mechanical realm with an underworld that is managed, controlled, timed and run by angels. In our previous video we decoded from scripture what the cherubims were and their functions. This is to help you identify what angels really are and the various models and roles they play in the underworld and how they relate to our luminaries in the heavens. Today we are going to continue decoding various scriptures and show you how we relate these to the workings of the realm. This time we look at the seraphims in more detail and how important it is for you to understand what they are and how their looks will vary by their geographic location. What we are revealing is that every culture in our realm has a piece of the jigsaw, a roadmap of technologies and angels in the underworld which we are piecing together into our model. I'll now hand the microphone over to One Conscience. Okay. So what are the seraphim in the Bible? The seraphim are angelic beings mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. These angels appear to Isaiah as God called Isaiah to prophet, prophetic ministries through a vision. As Isaiah watches, he sees the Lord God himself seated upon his throne with all majesty and power. He then sees some strange looking beings which he called Seraphis, seraphs. <laughs> so, Isaiah 6 2 Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. So, the seraphim being six wings, two covering the eyes, two covering the feet, and two for flying. Now the two covering the eyes means it's not going to be projecting a luminary. The two covering the feet means it doesn't move, so it's a stationary angel. And the two for flying means it's going to project the halo, so it's used for guidance. The, the solitary halo in the heavens as you see above there. Uh, for guidance, as in helping guide certain luminaries along certain paths. So it tells me this is the ones that switch on and off. These are the ones we see on the mimic map being transmitted to. Um, Isaiah 6, 3. Okay, and, and I don't know if you really have a lot else to say because that really, really covered it. But <laughs> Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, Isaiah 6, 3. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. Isaiah and one called out to the another and said, Holy. And one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And the last bit that has to do with seraphim that I've found so far is Revelations 4, 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Fantastic descriptions, isn't it? Aren't they? Yeah, they Among are. <laughs> called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Fantastic. Because it really is full of his glory, the, the whole earth. In other words, the underworld is full of his technologies doing their role. And they're all calling out to each other, saying, holy, holy, holy. In other words, they're communicating with one another. The mechanisms, the triggers, the switching, it's all connected. And the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand. So we're going back to the uh, the hot coals, which we're going to cover more in another presentation. 
a uh, good reference there again about touching the mouth of it and said behold this has touched your lips and your iniquity has taken away and your sin is forgiven so it doesn't sound like this these calls actually harm you you know reading into that uh, and the four living creatures each is one of them six wings on their eyes around them within and day and night they, they do not cease to say holy 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 is the Lord God etc etc <laughs> right, these are the seraphim, the six wing version of the cherubim. The eyes round and within. I think these are relating to the diagrams on the accelerators now. There's little emblems that seem to keep popping up everywhere. I'll, we'll, I'll put a, an overlay, an image of that so you can see what I'm talking about. They did not cease to say holy, holy, holy. So yeah, they're running 24-7. The Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. That's an easy bit. Who was, that's yesterday's son. Who is, who is today's son. And who is to come, that's tomorrow's son. Very easy to break down, isn't it? Yes. In other words, it's running, yeah, it's running, it's running all the time. Yeah, it's running all the time. And it was there yesterday, it's here today, and it'll still be here tomorrow. It's going to run forever and ever, as it says in Scripture. Now jumping back to the first part, here we see Isaiah seeing a different model of angel, the six wing description and what he describes as strange looking beings, the same types of description being noticed in various scriptures, beings, living creatures, cherubims, seraphims, angels. These are the different models of angels in the underworld, all having different looks, roles and functions and are directly related to the workings of our luminaries. Have we got evidence of that in the real world? Yes, this is uh, Crow 777's video capturing what he called a lunar wave. What it really is, is uh, mankind's or hu the human's first ever recording of an angel's projection in the heavens. And it was captured by the moon going past the, st the stationary halo and it being revealed as a as um, Crow 777 calls the lunar wave. It's actually just a stationary halo in the heavens that the moon's highlighted as it went past it. So I would say he was probably the first human in history to record a seraphim's projection. This is an animation I did here to show what's really going on. There's the projection, this is the moon going past and these are the two lines that you could see going down the moon. It always, it's always two lines and that's why you're looking at a circle, two sides of a circle basically. These are what people are calling sun dogs in the heavens, they're not sun dogs, they're projections used for guidance. And they usually have eight nodes on board like this. You'll see them, when you see these sun dogs you'll see these around it. So we'll give the uh, Crow Triple Seven a little award for that. <laughs> First human ever to capture Seraphim's projection. So we made a special card just for that moment. <laughs> but that's what we're looking at, guys. A projection. These waves that people call them, they're just projections from the technology in the underworld. And they're just going to keep coming. They're very predictable. Sandra, that's on the panel with us today, she's located a local one, she's trying to record it when the chemtrails reveal it or other map, other materials in the heavens reveal it and so far she's captured pieces of it in like one, one node lighting up where you get the rainbow effect off one and they're going to, they're going to keep turning up people Just keep scanning the skies, keep looking for them because they're there, they exist you're going to keep seeing them and seeing them, they're not going to go away Right now, back to the seraphim, six wings is a very good example. Look closely, you'll see two wings coming down towards the feet. Two in the centre. And the two at the top. So this is the representation of a seraphim. So you can see now the underworld is going to look amazingly spectacular. And these uh, sarcophagus, 
made a very good way of us to actually now look at these different models. But we can break down the role easy enough. It's the we wanted to know what the models looked like, and I'm pretty sure now these the Seraphim probably look very similar to this. But that's just one face, remember. Some of them have four faces. So you're gonna have a human face, a cherubim face, probably an eagle and probably a bull. Depending what uh, location in the world they're under because what you're looking at here is the designs are going to change in the underworld depending on geographic location. Same again, look, see the six wings on each. So the around Egypt is very busy with seraphim, but I, could ima I would imagine there's going to be lots and lots of seraphim because they are used for guidance for the luminaries. There's going to be a lot of these around the world and the designs will vary. This is obviously what they look like around Egypt. And if you look around other places in the world, you'll find six wings, but the features or design will change. So I now think the Egyptian era, or these, I think the I think Egypt or the Giza pyramid was the last stage of the construct, and these were the last ones made. It's more spectacular looking than some of the older models. So there's been like upgrades and different designs. And they probably take took into account the locality as well. You know, they'll be looking at the people that lived in the in the neighbourhood perhaps and modelled some of the designs off them. We'll know that more as we look at more of these because, you know, by geographic location these looks will change. So that's either by the location or they just upgraded them and got better skills or they just like different designs perhaps. Mm -hmm. There's a bit more to look at there, but the underworld is going to have lots of things like this in tunnels, etc, etc, and they'll be switching technology on and off and as things go by. Imagine like a, a kid's train set, you know, the, the an angel going past on its chariot and switching triggers and mechanisms. Some of this technology will start to project and guide and some will shut down. These are the earthquakes that we're seeing on the earthquake data. Technology switching on and off everywhere. So that's a pretty good breakdown of it, I think, so far. What do you guys think? Brilliant, yes. Absolutely. And when I first saw those wings on there, I was amazed. I have never noticed the wings on the sarcophagus. Neither did I. <laughs> Sneaky, isn't it? Eh? But you can see now it's very easy to very easy to start connecting dots, isn't it? Now, now you know what you're looking at. Yeah. Okay, so now we can add Nibiru to our list of seraphims um, based on what we found about it. So Nibiru is also a part of Babylonian astronomy. Nibiru is a term in the Arcadi Akkadian language translating to crossing or point of transition, especially of rivers. In Babylonian astronomy, the term Nibiru refers to the equinox and the astronomical objects associated with it. Nibiru is considered the seat of the Sumus Duis, who shepherds the stars like sheep. In Babylonian, it identifies with Marduk. The of Nibiru point is described in Tablet 5 of the creation epic Enuma Elise. When Marduk fixed the locations of Nibiru, Enlil, and Ah in the sky, Nibiru is Marduk's star, which he made appear in the heavens. The stars of heaven let him set their course, let him shepherd all the gods like sheep. Nibiru is described more closely on a complete cuneiform tablet, which states, Nibiru, which is said to have, have occupied the passageway of heaven and earth, because everyone above and below asked Nibiru if they could not find the passage. Nibiru is Marduk's star, which the gods in heaven caused to be visible. Nibiru stands as the post at the turning point. The others say of Nibiru the post, the one who crosses in the middle of the sea. Tiamat, without calm, may his name be Nibiru, for he takes up the center of it. The path of the stars in the sky should be kept unchanged.
Okay, so we'll go through Enoch a little bit more, and we'll go through chapters 32 through 36. From thence I went on towards the extremities of the earth, where I saw large beasts different from each other, and birds various in their countenances and forms, as well <clears throat> as with notes of different sounds. To the east of these beasts I perceived the extremities of the earth where heaven ceased. The gates of heaven stood open, and I beheld the celestial stars come forth. I numbered them as they proceeded out of the gate, and wrote them all down as they came out one by one according to their number. I wrote down their names all together, their times and their seasons, as the angel Uriel, who was with me, pointed them out to me. He showed them all to me and wrote down an account of them. He also wrote down for me their names, their regulations, and their operations. From thence I advanced on towards the north to the extremities of the earth, and there I saw a great and glorious wonder at the extremities of the whole earth. I saw there a heavenly gate opening to heaven, three of them distinctly separated. The northern winds proceeded from them blowing cold, hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. From one of the gates they blew mildly, but when they blew from the other two gates it was with violence and force. They blew over the earth strongly. From there I went to the extremities of the world westwards, where I perceived three gates open as I had seen in the north the gates and the passages through them being of equal magnitude. Then I proceeded to the extremities of south, where I saw three gates open to the south, from which issued dew, rain, and wind. From there I went to the extremities of heaven eastwards, where I saw three heavenly gates open to the east, which had smaller gates within them. Through each of these small gates the stars of heaven passed on and proceeded towards the west by a path which was seen by them and that at every period of their appearance. When I beheld them, I blessed every time in which they appeared. I blessed the Lord of glory who had made those great and splendor signs that they might display the magnificence of his work to the angels and to the souls of men and that these might glorify all his work and operations, might see the effect of his power, might glorify the great labor of his hands, and bless him forever. Enoch clearly describes the corners of our world, as well as the functions, path, and timing of our luminaries. He has even told their names. This is information we should all know. This is information that we need to learn again. This is something I will continue to work on on and learn as it is the base of our world workings and creation with that being said we will probably wrap this up for now we wanted to give you a bit of a different view of how the scriptures are translated as you can see people our research is revealing a very intelligent creator who has created a realm which can only be described as a technological masterpiece, a construct beyond our comprehension as our ancestors found and tried their best to describe. You will also notice we are decoding geoglyphs, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs. The reason for that is because they are telling the exact same story, the only difference being the descriptions of the angels and this is due to their varying roles and different looks in different geographic locations. They are still part of the same mechanisms that give us our luminaries and a great many other things. A construct designed and maintained to the highest standard with the most ornate descriptions one can possibly imagine. We hope you enjoy our research and information and that it helps you see and recognize there is a creator their glory being revealed in a way we did not expect to see, let alone find. We fully accept this and look upon our realm with new eyes and knowledge. A knowledge that seems to have been lost, yet is depicted everywhere in sacred geometry, scriptures, geoglyphs, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs. 
How did it come to be that we have forgotten all that was once known everywhere in our realm? I'll leave you with that thought, so until next time, it's goodbye from us.